Welcome to the Silver Screen Guide Podcast. Join Corbin and Alan, along with guest hosts, as they bring their love for the cinema to discuss films from every genre and decade. Learn about the history of the film, little-known facts, and insightful explorations while they enjoy discussing your favorite film. The curtain is rising and your podcast is starting. So sit back, relax, and enjoy your guide to the silver screen. Welcome listeners to the first installment in our Candyman movie review series. Today we are reviewing Candyman. This is your co-host Corbin. And I'm Alan. We are going to be reviewing all four films, well, all three released films leading up to the theatrical release of the same name, Candyman 2021 version that releases Friday, August 27th. Our review drops Monday, September 6th. I'm pretty excited considering Jordan Peele is executive producing. I'm a big fan of Mm -hmm. Us and Get Out. He's not directing, mind you, but nevertheless, this was one of the most influential horror films on him. When he was young, this 92 Candyman, which is what we're going to be talking about. Last week, we did do a special re-release of Prisoners just to dip your toe back into the Denis waters before we come back with Enemy on September 13th. And the two weeks before that, we had theatrical releases. The week before that, we reviewed M. Night Shyamalan's Old. We have now reviewed all 14 Shyamalan films. And then the week before that, we wrapped up our Space Jam trilogy with space jam a new legacy those episodes are now available links to those are in the description below before we get too far into the podcast listeners don't forget to subscribe share with your friends and family no matter where you're at leave us five stars and a short written review that really does help us in the rankings with the algorithms and it's a great free way to support us Make sure to check the description down below. We have a curated list of episodes we think you'd like to listen to after this one. Timestamps if you're ready to jump in. Links to all of our podcast pages, our social media pages, our Patreon if you want to support us financially and get some great bonus content that's down there as well. And then of course, we always give the release calendar. You're going to go view the full release calendar, but we always give you the next four weeks of episodes that are coming out so you can watch those movies so you're ready to talk about them with us. So Candyman here in the United States was released Friday, October 16th, 1992. As of the time of this recording, that was 28 years, 8 months, and 23 days ago. Alan, you and I weren't even born yet. That It came out um, two years and three months before I was born and three years and two months before you were born. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Um, let's see, my parents would just have been married no more than a couple years before this. Um, so yeah, we were too young to see this. <laughs> too young before we were even, uh, before we were even a thought this movie came out. <laughs> We were, we were a twinkle in our parents' eye. That's all we yes. were. A couple years later, we would be on the scene. If you are curious, listeners, what this kind of scores this movie got, how well it did at the box office, all that good stuff, go ahead and listen to your guide to Candyman that came out last Thursday. That's the first link below. Well, Alan, I am curious, though, if you're old enough or maybe not even old enough, somewhere around the demographic age for this movie – It's 1992. Would this trailer catch your attention? Would you go see this movie in theaters? Um, probably, I would probably skip this one. Um, from what I see in the trailer, it looks pretty generic for a horror movie like this. It actually kind of reminds me of, you know, the more, uh, it, it reminds me more of an 80s style horror movie. Uh, something like, you know, Halloween or Friday the 13th. That's what I'm really reminded of when I'm watching a trailer like this. It kind of looks like it's trying to capture that same style. So I don't know. I don't think I would necessarily be too keen to watch it. I would probably wait for it to be released before I watch it. Um, So, yeah, I'm saying I'd probably skip this one uh, when it released in the theater. I got to say, Alan, I, I am with you on this trailer, actually. It does 
kind of catch my interest, but I would wait for the reviews to come out. I don't think the trailer quite does the movie justice, you know, looking back after I have watched the movie. It's kind of a strange trailer. Maybe it's due to the 90s and how they cut trailers back then, but I I don't think I would go see it in theaters. Mm -hmm. I am curious though, Alan, is this your first time watching the movie for this review or have you seen it before? Yeah, this would be my first time. It's a movie that I feel like I've always heard about, but I've never actually like watched it or heard, you know, if it's a good or not. It's always been something that I see around or hear about it every once in a while. As for its quality, I, ne- I haven't really heard much about it. So this would be the first time I'm watching it would be for this review. Um, so I'm like a newborn to this kind of a this movie <laughs> and the series. So the first time that I watched Candyman was October 17th, 2019. I watched it on Netflix. I did actually write a review for it on Letterboxd. Um, I'll link to my original review for Candyman um, down there below. But I had known about Candyman before seeing it. Uh, Tony Todd with the bees covered all over him and his hook hand. It's one of those movies I had just kind of seen pictures of, heard about, didn't know a thing Mm -hmm. about it. Um, That him covered with bees is a bit of an iconic image in horror circles. So it was on Netflix. I don't, I guess I didn't have anything better to do on October 17th. Well, listeners, if you haven't seen Candyman and you don't want it spoiled for you, I highly recommend that you don't have it spoiled for you. There's a lot of interesting stuff in this movie. So go ahead and click pause right now. Go watch the movie and then come back and click play here and we'll be ready to talk about it. Helen Lyle, played by Virginia Madsen, who is a graduate student, and her husband Trevor Lyle, played by Xander Berkeley, he works for the University of Chicago and that's where she is a graduate student at. Helen is gathering information from the freshmen about urban legends, while her husband is jumping the gun already teaching the lesson. One of the freshman girls introduces Helen to the legend of Candyman. And the janitor further confirms the myth is, in fact, a grim reality. Her friend, Ruthie Jean, was murdered by Candyman at the Cabrini Green Housing Project recently. While researching the housing complex, Helen learns where she lives, Lincoln Village, also started as a low-income project, but was converted into upscale living due to the layout of the city. Because it shares the same blueprints as Cabrini Green, she figures out there's a hole behind her medicine cabinet, realizing this is the way the killer could have gotten to his victims. Helen convinces her research partner, Bernadette, played by Cassie Clemens, to search out Cabrini Green. They learn from Anne Marie, played by Vanessa Williams, who lives across the hall from Ruthie Lee, that no one will save them from Candyman. Later that night at dinner, Professor Philip Purcell, played by Michael Culkin, embarrasses Helen by telling her he wrote a paper 10 years ago about the infamous murderer. In 1890, the legend first appeared. Candyman was the son of a slave. His father amassed a fortune designing a machine to mass produce shoes out of the Civil War. He had went to all the best schools, grown up in polite society, and he painted portraits of famous people. A wealthy landowner commissioned him to capture his daughter's virginal beauty. Candyman and the daughter fell madly in love, and she became pregnant. The father paid hooligans to saw off his right hand. A little more than hooligans, I would say. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Sawing off someone's right hand. Yeah, I think it's a step above that, uh, a hooligan. Pretty evil. They chased him to Cabrini Green and smeared honey onto his body. In the end, he was stung to death by a thousand bees and burned on a giant pyre. His ashes were scattered over Cabrini Green. Helen travels back to the apartment complex alone, where she meets a little boy named Jake, played by Duan Guy. The little boy takes her to where Candyman lives, in a standalone bathroom, where he supposedly murdered a mentally handicapped kid. While exploring the decrepit bathroom, Helen gets knocked over the head by a pretend Candyman, who is just the leader of the Overlord's gang. The legend is seemingly solved. They're pinning all the murders on the phony. Except the fact he didn't brutally murder her raises some questions. While leaving the parking lot at Chicago University, she finally comes face to face with Candyman, played by Tony Todd. Without the whispers, he is nothing. She doubted him. His congregation no longer believes, so he was obliged to come. There must be a new victim. He takes her to the slaughter of the dog, and the baby, Anthony, is gone at Anne-Marie's apartment. 
The police barge in, arrest Helen since she's wielding a butcher's cleaver and she's forced to spend the night in a jail cell because Trevor isn't home at 3 a.m. He picks her up the next morning where they meet with their lawyer who tells them the police are going for first degree murder. Candyman visits her again. He murders Bernadette this time, but only Helen is found in the house, which ultimately puts her in a psych ward for a month. Once she realizes her predicament, Dr. Burke, played by Stanley DeSantis, tells her she's been charged with first degree murder. To prove Candyman exists, she looks into a mirror and calls him. He appears, murders Dr. Burke, frees Helen, and flies away, but before doing so, tells her the congregation shall witness a new miracle tonight. She escapes the hospital to find Trevor already repainting their apartment with his new college girlfriend. She goes to Candyman, where she learns 100 years ago he fell in love with her. It's always been Helen. She makes a deal. She'll die with him if he releases baby Anthony, whom he has kept secret in his lair. But Candyman puts baby Anthony on the soon-to-be bonfire, which is the centerpiece of a party to happen in the neighborhood soon. Helen tries to rescue the baby, but the people believe it's Candyman rooting around in the mountain of trash. They set a fire, which Candyman uses to keep Helen and the baby until they die and she becomes immortal with him. But she escapes the fire with her hair burned off while saving baby Anthony. Candyman seemingly perishes in the fire. Helen does not survive her burns. At her burial, the residents of Cabrini Green come to pay their respects. In a surprise move, Jake drops Candyman's hook into her coffin, implying the vindication that the legend was real after all, or possibly something more sinister. After her burial, Trevor, now lamenting her death and what he once had, says her name five times in the bathroom. She appears to him, murdering him with the hook, leaving the girlfriend to scream over his dead body while wielding a large knife she used to cook dinner. At Candyman's lair resides a new painting, an angelic portrait of Helen enraptured in fire as credits roll. So I mentioned, um, a, you know, when we were talking about the trailer, and I think I mentioned it in the background, um, that this week kind of feels like uh, it's going for that 80s style of, of horror movies, right? And it, I mean, it kind of makes sense. This is a 92, so the 80s were had just come to a close more than a few years before this. Um, I think it's most evident in this opening where it's, it focuses on, um, a different couple, right? It kind of reminds me of Halloween almost with this opening where it's focusing on something else other than our main characters to set up, you know, the first kill more or less. Um, it sets up this, you know, this legend of Candyman and whatnot, so I feel like that's kind of, you know, what it's going for is that 80s style of horror movies, which, again, kind of makes sense, given how, you know, this released no more than a few years after the 80s wrapped up anyways. See, I found that to be very fascinating because the first time we're told about Candyman, aside from we see the bees and we get a kind of an opening voiceover from Tony Todd, and then we won't hear from him or even see him until 45 minutes into the movie. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because it's an urban legend, but this is actually in the suburbs with white people. This has nothing to do with an urban ghetto and black people right. whatsoever when we're first introduced to the legend, which shows me that the legend has spread far beyond far beyond Cabrini Green, even though we know, well, as the legend goes, that's where Candyman was ultimately murdered, and that's where his ashes reside, is in Cabrini Green. Um, I do want to get your take, though, on the opening of this movie, because we see, it's not very good visual effects, we do see all those bees swarm over Chicago. Oh, also, yeah. Alan, does any of this look familiar to you? Oh, not at all. I, I don't recognize any of this. Uh, <laughs> no, was that what that was? It was bees that they were, yes. that were taking over the city? Because I thought it was just dark clouds <laughs> that were overcoming no. the city. No, I know it's a huge trope to use dark clouds and Ghostbusters and so <laughs> many different movies. The list goes on. This is Candyman. I don't think it's actually real bees swarming Chicago like the plagues of Egypt. Mm. I think this is more so a metaphorical thing that he holds 
to in total dominion over the city and its residents. The legend looms large. That's the way I took it, even though I think it's a scene that's kind of introduced and dismissed fairly quickly. I think it's something you, you could forget about. Yeah, yeah. I know that one of the things that they mentioned uh, in this opening too from Helen is that, you know, well, you know, there was a murder in this neighborhood or in this part of the United States. And then this very similar one in a different part and they were attributed by the candy man or something along those lines like there's a connection in between the urban myths and that they were projecting you know the hardships onto this this legend that's really the only reason why uh those two things were related so i can see that uh but you're right they bring it up and then it's that's pretty much it they they go along with it but it's more or less just focus on cabrini green Right. And the other thing is, you did bring up a good point. I wanted to address that before we moved on too far. This does give you a kind of a Halloween feel or a Nightmare on Elm Street type feel in the beginning, where Mm -hmm. we do see this young couple. And of course, in horror movies, if you have premarital sex, you're going to die. It does seem to play on that promiscuity trope right there. But nevertheless, I think this movie is setting up our expectations just to subvert them because this really isn't like a nightmare on elm street or halloween to me or friday the 13th to me anyways this is going to be something with i would say much more mature themes more adult themes and it's going to have a far more supernatural element than michael myers getting stabbed with a coat hanger and stabbed with the knife and he still keeps coming this is we're going to get into it a little bit later this is very almost religious and what it depicts here which is interesting this is kind of well i will say this is a slasher movie i will say it goes beyond those conventions and tries to be what do you want to call it like a high concept slasher or something i don't know if those really exist except maybe here right right yeah. But I will say I am immediately gripped by the opening shot of the movie with the city where they took a heli- they were on a helicopter and they pointed the camera mounted the camera straight down. This mm-hmm. was the first time that had ever been done before. They had never done this for a movie before. And we get Tony Todd's incredible voiceover where he's so menacing where he says what is blood except for shedding and I do like how the cars in the city are contrasted with a honeycomb and bees and how we're all just kind of worker bees. And he seems to be somewhat like a god looking over the city. Take what you will from the opening shot, whether that's Candyman looking over the city, um, except in, in many ways, he's kind of the anti-god instead of he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the mm-hmm. whole world's blood ready to shed, <laughs> it seems like. But I, I want to know, Alan, does this opening pull you in? I have to say it, it does. I was very curious to see where else it was going to go from this opening because it feels more uh, artsy fartsy than what a normal movie like this would really ever do. Um, you know, like we've been talking about like Nightmare on Elm Street or Halloween, you know, those don't really go down this route of, you know, being a bit more abstract with what it's showing here at the very beginning, which is, you know, you see the city of Chicago and you see these dark clouds or bees, you know, overcoming the city. You have a straight down shot of a helicopter following a group of cars as they drive into the city. Um, You have these, you have this really strained voiceover, which, you know, without the context of what happens later in the film, you know, it's just very strange. So I would say, yeah, I very much pulled in. I'm curious to see where this is going to go because it's not one that I've, not what I was expecting out of a, a movie like this. It is a cult film, so I knew it would be probably a bit weirder than what you normally would see with an American film. Um, but I was curious to see where it was going to go. So yeah, I would say that this opening definitely hooked me to drag me into the story and be curious as to, you know, now I want to know what's going to happen. We'll also say there's somewhat of a fairy tale vibe to this opening here mm-hmm. where we are getting to see the legend of Candyman, and it's a little childish. Say his name five times in a mirror and he appears. Clearly, that's taken from Bloody Mary. Right. And I do really like – I like how it's edited. 
I will just come out and say right now, maybe my favorite part about this movie is Philip Glass's score. I yep. can't get that piano out of my head. It is so beautiful and haunting. But the entirety of this kind of story within a story here is um, all just told. Oh, it's almost like a silent movie with a voiceover until the couple, um, until the girl finally speaks and says, not here, I have a surprise for you. And then she, we don't ever know what that surprise is except her gruesome murder. We have no idea if the story is actually true or not. Mm -hmm. It just shows that the legend has spread far beyond the black urban area, you could say, and into the white subconscious or the uh, something along those lines. Um, it's very interesting. It's very gripping, I think. Yeah. Um, we also see there's a lot of dichotomy in this movie where um, Helen and her husband having marital issues and Candyman and his girlfriend from 100 years ago, um, they weren't allowed to be together. It was not very favorably looked upon, especially having a child, interracial child out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. um, we get a lot of that contrast here where Candyman ultimately wants to woo Helen through some destiny sort of way. It is kind of her reincarnated a hundred years later. That's a very interesting part of the story. I don't think is explored a whole lot. I will say the story is better for it. I feel like the less we know about the mythos of Candyman and how Helen is actually connected to him, the more that I like it, the more I enjoy the mystery. Right. I, I agree. And I think also kind of going off of that, there's an interesting view, or at least the way that I read it, um, an interesting view of, you know, how, I guess, underprivileged or lower on the socioeconomic totem pole, um, how this movie views him, right? Because they talk about how, it's this kind of not so great neighborhood um, that this urban legend was born out of. Uh, but we follow, you know, a woman who is getting farther in her in her education. But multiple times we see, you know, men kind of getting in the way of things. For example, her husband, of course, is, an, is a good one. But a good example is also the restaurant scene that happens. I think it's pretty close to about midway. Um, mm -hmm. she, yeah. they're talking about the, uh, you know, the research that they're doing for this and he offers help. And then just without really even really asking, he says, oh, well, here's, you know, more to the story. And he, you know, just kind of butts in to, I guess, help them out as if they, f he felt like they needed it. Right. So I felt like this was also somewhat of a commentary on maybe, you know, women's social issues as well. Um, also one that could also be attributed to, you know, neighborhoods or communities that are also not as high into the middle class as well uh, kind of a commentary on them too so i feel like that is also another reading as to following the story of this you know urban legend um but dealing with lower income uh societies or lower income individuals it definitely is and that was kind of at the heart of the original short story, The Forbidden. I did actually get my hands on a copy. I read it for this review. I wanted to know what it was, how closely it tied in with the movie. I'll say it's very, very similar. It does follow Helen. It ends at different points. There's no backstory for Candyman whatsoever. He's not black. He actually looks like a very bizarre carnival type attraction type person. Mm. Uh, it looks very strange. Um, there is kind of this biblical aura about him and the legend, though, of course, sweets to the sweet. That's actually taken from Hamlet, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And where Barker actually got this idea was from a jar of honey in the UK, because he's British, with a bees kind of on top of a... Um, on top of the mule, which is taken from the Samson story, which is in the book of Judges. It talks about the sweet will draw from the strong, something like that. There's a lot to Barker's story, which I found very interesting. But you are right, Alan. There isn't just some racial commentary here in the movie. There is commentary on the poor, the wealthy, on male and female, on battle of the sexes. I it's all there. I think the one thing that I am at least grateful for is if they're going to talk about it, 
I don't think this movie is preachy about any of it. It mm -hmm. seems to bring this up in an intelligent way. We're not idiots. We can all discern what they're trying to say here in the movie is that you want to, you know, the white people want to stay out of the ghetto part of town. They talked about what the L train or whatever kind of separates the city off, separates kind of the good from the bad. You mm -hmm. don't want to go down to Cabrini Green. Yes, these snooty men will talk over the women and put them in their place. And but then again, you, you kind of get the revenge of the woman. Helen comes back in the end to get her supernatural revenge, just as Candyman, who was essentially born out of a horrible racist act, was getting his revenge, you know, hundreds of years later, still terrorizing people. Right. And ultimately, the thing that you wish to kind of quash is the thing that will come back to haunt you. That's kind of the main thing that I got from all of these different, you know, messages of class and whatnot is that ultimately what you try and quash or keep separate will ultimately run together and ultimately cause ruination. There is a possible case to be made that Candyman isn't real in this movie. This is actually all, this is like a Shutter Island type movie mm -hmm. and it's all in Helen's head and she's the one actually committing the murders. She's the one actually doing these things. I, I think Candyman is a real character in this movie. I think there's too much evidence to support that he's real, but I do... I, I think some of this stuff could be explored further, but I do like there are psychological elements to this movie that we're talking about of w what if the legend isn't real and some people get too, uh, too fascinated with it. Because mind you, Alan, Candyman does not appear until Helen gets that horrible concussion. Right. I think that's something we have to point out. Right. That Yeah, you do have a point. Uh it isn't until late into the movie when there's a big accident that he finally starts to appear. Yeah, I say that is definitely a legitimate question to ask is, you know, you know, what is the reality of Candyman? Is he actually a thing or is he like just something that, you know, now our main character is starting to fall victim to, which is that it's just a legend. Um, yeah, that's definitely, you know, I would say up for debate as to which one is, you know, if he is or is not a real living being or if he's just manifested his own manifested himself inside of the mind of our own of our main character um yeah i say that's definitely up for discussion and i'm going to make the case that Candyman is an antichrist of sorts he is mm -hmm. very much a god figure um he talks about you doubted me so i was obliged to come you know, later he kind of ascends into the sky. He flies away when he flies out that window. I mean, there's a lot of creativity to this, but he talks about the faith of his congregation, talking about being immortal. We see in Helen's room, she has like two pictures of the Virgin Mary, a crucifix over her bed. Clearly, she has some, you know, association with Christianity. Clearly, she's a believer or else she wouldn't have that stuff over there is mm -hmm. what I would take from that. And Candyman is kind of this god of the urban people or whatever. I don't know what you want to say it. He is this weird old god you could kind of take it as or something of that kind. I found that to be interesting because I'm thinking of Paul on the road to Damascus who Paul's purpose, or Saul, as he was originally called, his purpose was to destroy Christianity, destroy people's faith. That's exactly what Helen does. She destroys the faith. She seemingly destroys the legend. It's mm. really just a guy running around with a hook in his hand, and he's just playing pretend, essentially. Candyman can't have that. Jesus sees an opportunity as well. Jesus comes, changes Saul to Paul. He says, you doubted me you did not believe so now i'm going to, i'm going to appear to you that's exactly what Candyman does it's very very similar to saul on the road to damascus i found that a very interesting parallel you know the writers are trying to draw this parallel there's not a coincidence here that yeah. they're pulling this but he's a very very dark jesus if that's what you want to call him 
No, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's it's kind of hard to watch this movie and not see some kind of religious imagery uh, in the story. Um, even with, you know, Candyman himself, right? How he talks more like it's a passage from the Bible almost, or and at least in the same fashion, right? And I think for me, I think they're definitely going for like a more antichrist visual with the Candyman himself, right? Um, but if... I think there's also an interesting line. I, I think it's said more than once, um, but he essentially says that, you know, I can't exist outside of, you know, I, I live because, oh no, without the writing on the wall, I am nothing is what is what he says, right? Which kind of gives yep. credence that he's really just more of an idea than he is a physical thing, right? So True. I'd say, yeah, it's a manifestation of all the fears of, the village or the neighborhood that um, the neighborhood of Cabrini Green kind of becomes a manifestation of the fears of Helen at a certain point in the story. Yeah, I could definitely, I think you're def absolutely right. They're definitely going for a visual or a manifestation of, you know, uh, of some kind of antichrist. Um, and he ultimately leads our main character to follow him um, when it gets to the end of the story. Uh, which she kind of becomes, or I guess takes the role of what Candyman was and then seeks out some kind of revenge at the end. Yeah, there's definitely that, you know, Antichrist visual uh, and definitely some of the storytelling definitely revolves around something like that. Well, we have talked about some of the more metaphorical aspects of the movie, but I got to say, especially for a horror movie, I don't think horror movies always have the best technical aspects I got to say, I think some of the cinematography is great. The set design is really engrossing. And of course, Philip Glass's score is pro probably too good for this movie. <laughs> I think from what I understood, Glass didn't actually know he was scoring this for a horror movie. Mm -hmm. Bernard Rose came to him and said, hey, I'm doing a new movie. Can you make up a score? And he did. And then... They're like, oh, by the way, it's for a horror movie. And he's like, what? Okay, I guess I guess I'll do it. And he's he was still shocked he even did it because he never really wanted to make a score for a horror movie per se, which is just right. surprising. But yeah, Alan, I'm curious on your thoughts. They really did want to make this a solid production. They really wanted to try and make something special here. Yeah, I absolutely uh, agree that you know, Philip Glass's score is great. <laughs> I didn't know what to think about it at first. And I think most of it was just because it felt very, uh, it felt very artificial at first because it is using a lot of the older MIDI sounds of a chorus or the piano or whatever. It just didn't feel, uh, it didn't feel uh, real at first. But as the movie goes along, I think I understood why Philip Glass kind of went down that road um, and I feel like you know, after thinking about it, I think it fits um, a lot more than I thought it had initially. Uh, yeah, this this score is really great. I Philip Glass, of course, is no uh, new name to writing any kind of movie scores. He's one of the legends at this point. Um, but yeah, but aside from aside from score, you mentioned set design, and I have to I have to agree with you there as well. Uh, it's quite engrossing, especially when you get into uh, the Candyman's lair, where it's like in this deep pocket of just uh, condemned nothing of uh, of urban society. Uh, it definitely is stuff that I really like to see. I like I always tend to like you know more rundown condemned buildings kind of like this that are completely abandoned no one's gotten to touch them for years and and whatnot definitely when it comes to those aspects that's i think where you know the set design or the i guess the locations that they shot in really you know help out the movie a lot and really pull at least me in a lot more seeing things like that so yeah both of those aspects i definitely agree um both of them are rather strong for this film that is one of the more unique things about this movie is we've seen a lot of movies with haunted houses, with, you know, gothic castles. They thought we're nobody's mm -hmm. 
Nobody's as scared of an old castle anymore. Nobody's scared of a haunted house anymore. What are people scared right. to go now? People are scared to go to the bad part of town. And that's where Candyman lives is the bad part of town. You know, what I, they do a great job, especially in Candyman's Lair. It does kind of have this old gothic feel like it's a rundown Dracula type castle, except now it's in the projects, except now instead of tapestries on the wall, it's graffiti. It mm -hmm. is kind of uh, you go to like the Sistine Chapel, you see all these wonderful Michelangelo paintings on the ceiling. What if we saw those and instead they were graffiti or they're kind of telling the legend of Candyman like a lot of Christian artists would originally do to tell the story of Christ, to tell the story of the saints. Right. Except now it's with Candyman. And so going into the ghetto, going into the bad part of town, going where people are afraid to go now, I think is a fantastic idea. To me, it makes a lot of sense of where to set the place. I, I, I'm struggling to think of any other movie that has really done that well anyways. Um, so they did a great job with that. The score is so haunting cinematography. One of the, there's two times that like really stands out to me. And that's when Helen is speaking with um, Jake um, about Candyman and whatnot. When she first meets him in the apartment and we see the grating, which is supposed to be just kind of like an extra layer of protection in the ghetto, mm -hmm. but the shadow on her face looks like a honeycomb to me. I thought that was great usage of foreshadowing of how she's been marked by Candyman. And then also when um, she finally comes, when she comes to Candyman in his lair and he embraces her and there's this really weird spinning where they're spinning and then everything else around them is spinning too and she kind of falls into that trance with philip glass's score in the background it all works so well yeah absolutely agree now believe it or not alan whenever helen sees Candyman and she kind of has this glazed look in her eye they do a great thing where they kind of put some light over her face. That's a classic movie trick is to kind of shadow everything else except the light over the eyes. Mm -hmm. Virginia Madsen is actually hypnotized in those scenes. They legit they had a real hypnotist come on set. And um, for those scenes, whenever she would meet the candy man, they would actually hypnotize her. So she is not in a full level of consciousness if that's mm -hmm. how you want to say it she is under a a real hypnotic spell and she talked about this many times in the bonus features on the commentary how it was very bizarre for her and ultimately it came to mess with her mind in ways she just did not like and so she was really done with the whole um hypnotizing stuff but you got to say they're committed. They're doing something. Yeah. Like I said, that I just don't really have heard of before on other horror movies where when yeah. she sees the bad guy and he does hypnotize her, that's actually real. She is fully kind of falling under that spell. It is, it works really well in the movie. And now you know why, because it's actually real. <laughs> that's really interesting. I never would have guessed that they decided to hypnotize the main actor for portions mm -hmm. of the movie. I can honestly say that's the first I've ever heard of something like that happening on set. Oh yeah, it is. One of the last things I'll say about this movie that I really love is Candyman's dialogue. Now, some of this, most of it, I would say is actually pulled straight from the prose of the short story mm -hmm. where he talks about, you have destroyed the faith of my congregation. What do the good know except what the bad teach them by their excesses? It is a blessing to live in people's dreams, but not to be. As you mentioned earlier, I am the writing on the wall. I am the whispers in the classroom. If you knew me, you would not wish to live. How easy does fame and immortality come than to be one of my victims? And of course, it's just been ringing in my head ever since I engrossed myself in the property to get ready for the review, but be my victim. Mm. That's one of the first things he says to her talking about how he was obliged to come because she doubted him. He says, be my victim, which I think there's a lot wrapped up in that, but I've just been looking in the mirror every day and all I can hear is be my victim. I'm like, oh yeah. gosh, it's gotten under my skin. <laughs> yeah, I mentioned earlier that, you know, Candyman's lines feel like they're 
almost like they're sometimes pulled out of, you know, the writing of the Bible, or they are also, you know, they feel like they're not real almost. Like they feel like they're, they're something that some kind of, you know, being would say, not necessarily something that a yeah. villain would say necessarily. His lines definitely go down that route where they feel like they're coming from some kind of religious thing rather than a normal person. I think it definitely leads to making the enigma that is Candyman. That's exactly what they wanted. They wanted it to feel out of time. They mm -hmm. wanted it to feel something not of our vernacular. And I think they nailed it. They really did. I was very, very impressed with Candyman's writing, with his dialogue, because it just, I mean, you know, most horror villains say cheesy things, say derogatory things, mm -hmm. stupid stuff. This is very highfalutin with the way he talks, with the way he draws Helen in, with the way he is very godlike in his presence. He's Tony Todd is 6'5 with those heels on. He's probably around 6'7, <laughs> 6'8. Six, six, he's huge. Yeah. He's tall. He is very slender and elegant. And his voice is very, very captivating whenever he talks. Right. And it's just weird stuff that I wouldn't think of how they strap her down on the psychiatric bed and he's just like hovering above her. And then after he kills Dr. Burke, he just kind of wraps himself up and it's just like pulled straight out of the window. He just is very strange with his actions, but honestly, I really like it. It's just stuff I wouldn't have thought of per se, but I'm like, this is weird. This just further makes his character very interesting to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I will say one thing that I am disappointed about is I don't want to know Candyman's backstory. <laughs> I, I feel like that is needless. That is one exposition dump that I'm really surprised about. In the original story, there is no backstory for Candyman. Mm -hmm. He just is this kind of malicious presence, very much very similar to um, Pennywise from Stephen King's It. He's just kind of this bizarre carnival sideshow thing. Uh, he doesn't really have much of an origin. Now, of course, it has an origin, which I won't spoil, which is super, super bizarre. But I, I prefer the strange mystery. You know, props, they don't tell us Candyman's actual name. He's only known by Candyman, which was not cl clearly not his name. Right. Th giving him that name would humanize him and further take away from his mythos. I'm glad they don't go down there. I just wish they wouldn't give his backstory. I, I just prefer to not know that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think maybe what they're going for, I agree with you, but I think maybe what they're going for with giving him a backstory is maybe tying his what his story is in with our main character, Helen. Uh, when she becomes consumed by him and then ultimately takes his place. I think that's kind of why they went down this route to actually give him a backstory. But I absolutely agree with you. I would much rather like it if they just didn't tell it at all, right? It was just something, he just was a legend that just came up out of nowhere um, and people attribute murders to him, to, to Candyman, instead of giving him this whole backstory about... 1890s, he liked a girl and then her father didn't like him and killed him and that started the whole mystery, right? I am with you. I wish that they would have gone down the route of the short story, which sounds like there basically was no backstory. And that's kind of, you know, what makes him somewhat of a scary villain is that we don't know where he came from. He just kind of showed up one day. I think it still would work, with, you know, to for him to be still that object of manifestation of fears of those who live in the labor the neighborhood of Cribini Green. Yeah, I, I would agree with that as well. And if I had mentioned it already, this was actually shot at Cabrini Green, um, which has now been torn down. I think it's actually pretty nice building now. Who knows, Alan? Maybe you live in Cabrini Green and you don't even know it. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> oh I used to live like right down the road from it, actually. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in the northern part. So it's North Chicago is, you know, a much better, much better area than the south side of Chicago. That's interesting. Which is interesting because it used to not be. Yeah. As we that can see by the movie. Right. <laughs>
You know, also Helen's motivation to investigate urban legends, I feel like isn't given enough of a reason. J uh, just that she is writing this grad paper, we don't know why. And then her obsession with this, I feel like it's ill-defined why she becomes so obsessed with figuring it out, except that there is a connection between her apartment and Cabrini Green, that it was architecturally identical, and she little by little comes to find out there might be more to this legend than meets the eye. I feel like just her fascination with it to begin with could be better explained. It's different because in the short story, there's no such, there's no urban legend. She, she stumbles upon that by accident. In the mm -hmm. short story, she's fascinated with graffiti and the writing of graffiti, which we see plenty of love in this movie. Um, that's one thing I think they could do a little bit better. Um, also her false murder spree, I feel like isn't built up enough. There's no like forensic look into it either, whether, I feel like there there should have introduced a little bit more forensics into it. I feel like the murders are just kind of on her um, right away. And everybody just kind of accepts that she did it and they're not going to do any other investigation, <laughs> it seems yeah. like. Yeah, I also, I, I you're right. I also kind of attributed that to the same thing that we were talking about when we were discussing like, you know, those lower on the socioeconomic totem pole as it were um kind of just being oppressed right like no one's really looking into this investigation you know there's enough evidence here to show that you know she's the murderer um i guess even though we know that that's not the case you know um so i think that that's kind of what i attributed it to uh but i think you're right it's one thing that it's like just it's a it's an avenue that you know in reality would mo would be would be explored to just further solidify that evidence, but they just don't show it in the movie, uh, just because. Yeah, you're right. There's a little too much shorthand going on there for my liking. After okay, after we get past the opening scene where it it sets up Chicago and it sets up the first murder or at least the first murder on screen with the legend of uh, Candyman. For me, this movie just kind of takes a nosedive into Boringville up until oh, it, wow. uh, up until uh, we open with right the middle of the story with Helen uh, in Anne Marie's apartment um, with blood everywhere. For oh, a good stretch of the that's movie, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm just like, you got to be kidding me! Like this movie just feels like it just drags for some portions for me. I started a clock watch right before we got to that the middle portion the midpoint with uh with helen and Anne marie's place i was clock watching i gotta say it, it's not super engaging um leading up to the midpoint well that is where we really differ then because oh, really i'm to i'm totally engrossed with the mystery with the build-up mm -hmm. with the suspense of whether this is true or not and yeah, I'm totally into it. And there, there is that hard delineation where Helen wakes up in Anne Marie's apartment with blood everywhere. I remember, I'll never forget when I first saw the movie, how jarring that was, how utterly shocking that is. It's yeah. extremely gruesome. She finds the dog's head chopped off with a butcher cleaver and you think the baby has been butchered. It hasn't. Um, it was in the story. It was in the story, <laughs> but they changed <Yeah. laughs> They changed it for the movie. That is when it gets crazy. And to me, it sounds like people are of two opinion on this. And Rose talked about this in the commentary. He says, you'll either find the first half of the movie very interesting. And then all the air is let out of the balloon once we find Candyman because there's no more mystery to it. Mm -hmm. And then you'll find the second half to be kind of troubling or as in Alan's camp, you'll find the first half to be boring, and the second half is where your interest picks back up. So, that's interesting. There are two different camps. It sounds like we're in opposite camps, though. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely am in that second camp, because once uh, I once uh, Helen wakes up in Anna Marie's place with the head of the dog and the baby missing, that's when I was like, oh, this has turned into a completely different story. Now I'm interested, <laughs> because yes, I know you mentioned... Um, a little bit ago, the build up into that, uh, you you weren't a very big fan of the build up into this scene. 
Whereas for me, I liked that there kind of wasn't that much build up into it. It just kind of happens, right? Uh, that was where I started to get back into the story again is when something happens that I have no clue, at least at the time, I have no clue what in the world is going on. Um, and it's, you know, you just have Anne-Marie just screaming her head off because her baby has mm-hmm. gone. The head of a dog's on the floor. It's just insane the way that this movie enters its, its midpoint. And it got me back into the story. I was like, okay, now I'm curious to see where this is going to go again. Because at first I was, it was losing me. Now, Hitchcock, if Hitchcock was behind the camera, I think he would have done a much better job with the, what do you want to call it, the first half of this movie. Mm-hmm. Because I'm I'm thinking they're somewhat asking us to believe or question whether Helen did kill the dog or did kill the baby and whether she was subconscious, a willing participant, or if Candyman forced her to do it. I think there's a lot of questions there. I I mean, uh, the movie doesn't quite answer those for the better. But nevertheless, I like the idea of what if Helen is becoming so engrossed in this, she wants to commit these Candyman murders. She wants to be a part of it because Mm -hmm. we will see her at the end actually commit a murder. Now, that's her spectral form, if you will, her resurrected, you know, evil zombie side or whatever. But to me, that's the buildup that I felt like could have been much more interesting. A director like Hitchcock or Villeneuve would have made us question Helen more instead of just, I, I, I am curious, Alan, do you think Helen has become the bad guy? Do you think she's really committed these murders? Or do you think, as Candyman said, be my victim? She is just the victim and she's just been framed, essentially. Yeah. I felt like it was just that. Like, she's just caught in the crossfire. It's not her fault, but she's just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Candyman really was the per- is the thing that, you know, did these murders, but it wasn't her who it wasn't her who did them of course she's blamed for it right that's kind of what i feel is going on here now whether or not you know candy man the idea of candy man is taking over her in that such psychological form there could be an argument there that it, it's i guess her i guess you could say but like not under her own sound mind um but i think that it's candy man who committed the murders and she's just caught in the crossfire you know she's that victim as he was talking about See, I think this would have been a much more interesting first half of the movie is instead of her just being fascinated by it, she gets knocked over the side of the head by the fake Candyman. If she would have had some seemingly dark fascination with this in such a way as she wanted to be more of a participant instead of just Candyman's victim. That would have introduced a whole new psychological element to the movie that's not there as far as as far as my reading of it anyway. But there is just stuff about the latter half of this movie that I find to be very interesting, but I feel like I'm torn because there's stuff that's just not developed, but at the same time, that's kind of the point. It's kind of the legend. It's the mystery. Mm -hmm. We don't really quite understand um, until I think it goes pretty bonkers with Helen actually being the one that that is the new candy man, if you want to call her that, the candy woman. And then there, I love the final shot of the movie. I love it where it's Philip Glass's score and it's the zoom on her. Now she is like the new urban legend goddess or whatever. It's bizarre. Honestly, I think it's probably I think the story is probably better than it should have been um, with how much it delves into like myth and religion and stuff. It's really, really strange and unexpected, but I I kind of love it for that. Yeah, I agree. I got to say, for me at least, I think the voice of Candyman is probably the most iconic part about the character of Candyman for me. Um, It's also pretty clear that uh, his voice was... um, dubbed over uh, in post, it sure seems like, um, because there are a number of times where he doesn't, his lips do not match his his words. But that aside, us, other than the voice of Candyman, I never really found the character of Candyman to be very formidable. I never really felt like there was much of a presence from him 
on screen whenever he was on screen. The first time we see him is in the parking garage when Helen is about to head home. We kind of see him at a distance. Um, that's like the first like real time we get to see him outside of the opening shot. Um, ever since then, I ever every, every time after that that he you know was on screen, I never really felt like he you know brought much of a presence with him. Um, maybe it's because of the design. Maybe it's because of you know the actor who's playing him. Uh, I don't know, but I never felt like there was much of a presence with Candyman whenever he was on screen. And then that kind of led to it not really being all that scary uh, when it's all said and done for me. Mm. I have quite the opposite feeling. To me, this is more so a presence they're trying to draw on from Phantom of the Opera, from Dracula, where he isn't like Michael Myers. He's not this unstoppable force that is just featureless, just constantly coming after you and coming after you, this relentless nightmare. Instead, he is more of, I, I think he's more of a refined Freddy Cougar. He's a more, very much in the vein of Dracula, where he is somewhat omnipresent. He's omniscient. He is something very terrifying. He's very alluring. That weird romanticism of how he kisses her with the bees, which is really off-putting, but it mm -hmm. is just bizarrely romanticized during that entire scene. Um, like I said, there's so much we don't know as to why Helen looks like the woman he fell in love with from 100 years ago. That's pretty strange. But I like that they're not going for the, for the presence of a Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees. They're going right. for that old presence of Dracula where he will just f put you under total control just with a stare, just with the power of himself. I really like that. I grew up with the old universal movies of Dracula, with the Wolfman, with things like that, where there's more than meets the eye to him. Of course, he looks really disgusting with the bees caved into his chest and coming out of his mouth, which which they really did. They actually did that. That's not yeah. CGI. There's no such thing as CGI really back then. This is all practical. But his presence is is different. It's much different than I think what you might expect. I never find him to be scary in the traditional sense. I find him more so to just be menacing how he can take the baby and it'll just appear on the pyre. He will appear behind her and hold her because he they, he wants to die together so they can both be immortal. I think that's what's scary is I don't know what he means. Can he die? Is What does this mean? It's, just, it's very scary because he seems to have almost this godlike knowledge like to know and see like God that we don't know. I find that is what to be scary. Right. I think maybe for me, if they hadn't explained his backstory maybe that would maybe i'd be closer to how you feel about him than than what i do maybe if they had left that part of his story a mystery um and just kind of had him be kind of like the story like the, the actual book that this is based off of just kind of existing right he just kind of is not necessarily that there is any backstory behind it like you know that he was killed by some guy um, maybe that would put me in the same camp as you, where I feel his presence more on screen than uh, than what I feel I'm what I feel what I'm feeling now, right? I think maybe because yeah. there's too much explained, I know the I know the story behind Candyman, right? If that wasn't there, maybe I'd be in the same camp because I think I'm I'm okay with it not being something the same as Michael Myers, the shape, uh, or. Freddy Cougar or things like that, where they're like, it's like an unstoppable force. I'm okay with it not being like that way. Um, I'm more of just saying, I guess my feelings are more along the lines of that whenever he is on screen um, or even the idea of him, I just don't find very scary. If there wasn't a backstory, that might be the complete opposite. But I think because there is too much there uh, that takes away from the impact that his character has on me. And I mean, that is, that's kind of the story of Dracula is we don't quite know why he's so old and ancient and where he came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't need a backstory, you know, and I think that is one reason why I love Michael Myers so much, at least 
the original concept of him, not what's explored in later sequels, is he is so young and he does something really terrible. And then he is goes catatonic for 15 years. And then on that night, he comes home just to do something horrible again. We don't right. know his motivations. We don't know why. Um, whereas this does bring in some weird gothic romance of it's always been you, Helen, is what he writes on the wall. I don't know how these things come to occur, but it is very strange nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Now, this was not going to be um, the original end with Helen slicing up Trevor and the girlfriend without the bra on for some reason. Scre <laughs> very weird. Very Screaming strange. her head yeah. off. That was that, that was not the original ending of the movie. So, in the original ending, Helen is in Candyman's lair. And she is covered by 3,000 bees are all over the walls and they're all over her. And she is kind of wrapped in this type of honeycomb. And it's just a slow push in of her sitting there, with 3,000 bees all over her, covered head to toe, sitting down. And it's just a slow push in. And as she opens up her eyes, and then it just with the music and it rolls to credits. Um, now, I'd learned that from the commentary. That is not a um, that is not a deleted scene. Oddly enough, there is two cuts of this film. I did watch the theatrical and unrated director's cut, which mm -hmm. I could only tell maybe one minor difference. I am surprised they didn't reincorporate this into the director's cut. It's really weird, but um, I don't know. I'm sure that would have been a really really bizarre sight to behold. Um, yeah. I like the portrait though. Well, Alan, uh, I'm curious to see which way you go with this one. I was uh, I was expecting something, but now I'm not sure. What is your rating and recommendation for Candyman? I'm kind of torn with this one because on the one hand, it's got that, you know, that first half and parts of the second half, but I mostly attribute it to the to the first just kind of boring they're not it's not really all that interesting if it, i would say at times it kind of borderlines on that cliche you know there's the legend that deals with whatever thing is in this movie that's the bad guy right um there's always a legend behind everything with you know just as a trope for these 80s horror movies right it kind of bleeds into this one as well so that's not that's something that i think pulls away from it but then there's also the second half when you know all of a sudden she wakes up and there's a dog head next to her. There's blood everywhere. The baby of Anne Marie is gone, you know, and you just have no clue as to what in the world is going on, right? Um, that's kind of the stuff I'm just like, okay, now I'm interested. There's not much being explained here. Uh, and I like the mystery that they that they paint. So I'm kind of torn. Um, I think it's got good elements to it that you don't ever really see in, in horror movies. But it's also got elements into it that I think are just aren't really fleshed out very well and kind of, for me at least, pulled this movie down. Um, so I think it's a, I think overall it's a good movie. Definitely better than most uh, cliche horror movies, but I don't think it's necessarily anything fantastic. Um, I'll see what I think about it if I ever return to it. I, I, I would like to see it again later to see if my thoughts differ from what I'm saying here. So I'm gonna give it a six out of 10. I'm gonna give it a mild recommend um, but it's not one that I guess I was super crazy about when the movie was finally finished and all wrapped up. Candyman is a tour de force of the power of the subconscious. Is the idea that perpetuates a legend more frightening than the truth? Sometimes yes, but sometimes no. Candyman sets a horror movie like I haven't really seen it done before. Exploring the urban jungle of fanatics and fairy tales in the inner city is a fascinating location. A large portion of Candyman takes place during the day, which is also something we really haven't seen done until Jordan Peele would come onto the scene. Virginia Madsen and Tony Todd both give alluring performances, but Philip Glass's score really steals the film for me. His haunting score blends Victorian piano with a melancholy, reminding us of the antebellum age. This type of score overlaying scenes of urban blight shouldn't work, but it does instill a perfect atmosphere of macabre romanticism. To tie it all together, Candyman features a surprising amount of religious world building. 
drawing on Christian symbolism and turning it into something sinister. I appreciate Rose doesn't elaborate too much on the mythos of this character and ultimately how Helen becomes the lady in fire at the end of the film. It's such an odd arrangement. I don't think it should work, but thanks to engrossing set design, gripping cinematography, haunting music, and powerful performances, Candyman deserves to be considered one of the best horror films ever made. Candyman receives 8 stars out of 10 with a strong recommend. So yeah, we are kind of on opposite ends on this one. We are. And my score has not changed. You can go back and read my review from two years ago at this point. I stepped out of this movie just loving it. And that's Mm -hmm. just me. I mean, I love Jordan Peele's Us because there is this bizarre world building to it. I like this kind of stuff better than I like more straightforward horror like Halloween or Friday the 13th or just things like that where it's just feels very contained, very kind of down to earth. This has some weird supernatural, just bizarre stuff to it. And I I just feel like I want more horror like this, like Candyman, like us, like things like that, where it's just really something like we haven't quite seen before. It's very unique. So I get it. This movie doesn't work for everybody. It's kind of a divisive film. It sounds like sounds like your rating, Alan, falls pretty much in line with the Metascore at 61, Rotten Tomato audience at 62%. Even the cinema score, I think you probably would have walked out of this movie and been like, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a, it sounds like it's a little bit of a mixed bag for you. Yeah, I mentioned, well, yeah, in the background, I, I made the uh, the generalization that, you know, overall, this week seems to be just rather mediocre for it, pretty much everybody who watched it and rated it, uh, aside from Rotten Tomatoes. I'm kind of with it, although I think it's a bit above mediocre for me. Um, but yeah, Barely. I'm pretty much in line. <laughs> yeah. Well, I am curious, though, would you pick up or pass this on Blu-ray? I think I'd pick it up. Um, I also mentioned that I would like to see it again. So uh, I think I would pick it up. I think it's there's definitely enough there for me to justify a, a purchase. So that's a yes. I did pick up the scream factory blu-ray i picked it up um like a year and a half ago actually Mm -hmm. because we were supposed to be reviewing this movie like like i said like a year and a half ago oh yeah a long time ago and ultimately it got the 2021 version got pushed back so i've had this movie i bought it on a sale the scream factory i bought it on a sale for 10 bucks i have no idea what it's going for right now on blu-ray but yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, I, be- I better pick this one up. I got a rival like two years ago because I mm-hmm. thought we were doing Dune or something like that. It, I have all these movies ready because I thought we were getting ready to review them. They've just been sitting on my shelf. Yeah. I am curious, Alan, what other films, TV shows, books, or video games do you recommend our listeners check out? So we, you did mention this. Uh, I think you mentioned it in this podcast um or in the background hellraiser it is also by Mm -hmm. clive Mm -hmm. barker um directed and written by him i'm going to recommend that one that one's also got similar uh visuals to this one where it's you know the visuals are definitely not something that you typically see in a horror movie um so that one definitely i'm also going to recommend jacob's ladder the one from 1990 not the one that we reviewed from 2019. Um, I, that one definitely also has some weird visuals where you're questioning the sanity of the main character. So we have reviewed that one also, uh, if you wanted to listen to that. It's pretty easy to get your hands on. I think right now Hellraiser is on Prime. Jacob's Ladder might be a little bit of a different story, but it's not hard to find. I'm going to be recommending... The original film version of Dracula with Bela Lugosi. I got to say, if you want to know, I would say the core inspiration for this Candyman, it's Dracula. Absolutely. There are Mm -hmm. so many similarities to this story. I'm also going to be recommending the Disney film 
the haunted mansion Ooh. which i think is pretty much a big rip off of candy man but made for families um haunted mansion came out in 2003 it came out 11 years after candy man it is about um master gracie who they they flipped the racial stuff it's master racy gracie excuse me who's Freudian slip there, who is white, and Sarah Evers, who is black. He fell in love with her a hundred years prior, and she was tragically taken from him. But Sarah is the long lost reincarnation of her in this gothic mansion. Alan, have you seen it? No, I've seen like scenes oh. from it, but I don't think I've ever actually watched it all the way through. Yeah, in the Christian circles we grew up in, it probably wouldn't have been favorably looked upon, <laughs> is <Nope>. my guess. <laughs> um, Definitely it's not. really not that bad. But there is a lot of story stuff that I feel like they just ripped off from Candyman. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to be recommending The Letter with Betty Davis. Uh, what really got my interest in recommending that one, or at least piqued my interest, I thought, oh, this will be a good one to recommend to the listeners is the lighting effects they this old style lighting effects where they darken everything but light the eyes that's perfectly done in the letter there is um a story of kind of infidelity in that one as well um that is directed by william wyler based on the somerset mom story it is fantastic one of the most gripping openings for a film of that period the letter definitely check it out Hmm. Um, I'm also going to be recommending the one other film that Bernard Bernard Rose had done before this paper house. Very strange. If you want some strange imagery, I think I honestly, I, don't, I would really be curious for you to watch paper house. I think it's still on prime. Um, definitely check it out. Of course, I'm going to be recommending shutter Island and this last one is very hard to pronounce. It is Ko Kowani Squatsi, I believe is how you say it. For those who want to know, it is K-O-Y-A-A-N-I-S-Q-A-S-T-I. So it is actually scored by Philip Glass. It's not really a narrative movie. I was actually, um, my professor actually showed this to us in college. That's where I first heard of it. I was immediately gripped by it when I saw it. It is strange, haunting, it captures... A lot of stuff. It's actually the second film in the Katsi trilogy, from what I understand. Hmm. Um, I haven't watched it all the way through, but I think it's one that people have really kind of overlooked or completely forgotten about. So if you ever, if it's ever streaming, which probably won't be, and if you ever get a chance to get your hands on it, which would probably be pretty hard, then definitely check it out. So Rose was contractually obligated to write a sequel to Candyman. And he did. He wrote a sequel and the studio rejected it. Why did they reject it? Well, surprise, it had nothing to do with Candyman. So what Rose actually did was he wanted to adapt another Clive Barker story called The Midnight Meat Train, which was eventually made into a film in the 2000s starring Bradley Cooper, if I'm not mistaken. He wanted The Midnight Meat Train, ultimately that story, to come in at the third act of the film the first and second act would um, actually go go between the 1800s and present day. He wanted to explore the myth of Jack the Ripper. He kind of wanted to do what John Carpenter did with Halloween 3 and make this more of an anthology film. John Carpenter wanted to explore different scary Halloween legends. His was just kind of legendary killers. So, Barker was very wary of this, actually, because he felt The Midnight Meat Train would make a great film on its own. The studio, like I said, they didn't like Rose's script, and they wanted a repeat horror icon. They wanted Candyman to be the new, as we've said many times, the big three, Michael Myers, um, Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger, even Chucky. They wanted to churn out tons of sequels. They wanted this to be a cash cow. Of course, Rose had no interest in that whatsoever. So they decided to hire Bill Condon to do the sequel. Now, Barker is on record saying it was very well done. 
elegantly done as a matter of fact and well performed. So if Barker got the seal of approval for Candyman to Farewell to Flesh, I'm very curious to see it now. And especially Bill Condon directing the film Bill Condon did after Candyman was Gods and Monsters, which would earn him an Oscar for adapted screenplay. So at the very least, I'm expecting good writing out of this movie. Yeah, I, you know, from what we've recorded in the past, usually the sequel is one that, or the sequels is one that uh, is not really held in high regard. It's mostly that original, like Halloween, for example, is a great example. Oh, yeah. Well, listeners, the question after the show is, would you say Candyman's name five times in a mirror? I tried it yesterday. <laughs> I chickened out after the third one. So, no, I, I couldn't make it. I'll do it. I'll do it for the two of us, Corbin. Okay. Well, I hope I hope you make it, Alan. I hope you're <laughs> on the podcast next week with me. I guess listeners will have to wait and find out. All right, Alan, thanks for joining me. Sure thing. All right, listeners, thank you for joining us. Don't forget, if you liked this, make sure to subscribe, share with your friends and family. We will be reviewing Candyman 2021 in just three weeks. Very excited to see what Jordan Peele has in store as executive producer for that film. And make sure to join us next week as we review Candyman Farewell to the Flesh. Hey listeners, it's Corbin. Don't forget to check out the exciting links in the description below that will connect you with more great movie reviews for your listening pleasure and our YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter page. And of course, our official website where you can read great articles and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Also, if you want exclusive bonus content such as extra movie reviews, movie commentaries, and our thoughts on the latest movie news and trailers, plus more, then check out our Patreon page. It's a great way to help keep this show free, and it gives you great content that's yours to keep. All of that and more is found in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe whether you're on YouTube, Apple, Google, or Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. And while you're at it, please leave us a five-star review so other movie lovers can more easily find our podcast. We love talking about movies, and we love talking about them with you. So don't forget to share with your friends and family, and we'll see you next week, listeners. The Silver Screen Guide podcast is edited and produced by Alan and Corbin. Intro and outro music is created by Thomas Rankin. The thoughts and opinions herein expressed are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent those held by Silver Screen Guide. Silver Screen Guide is not affiliated with any company or individual involved with the creation of this movie or TV show. No portion of the podcast may be used without express written permission from Silver Screen Guide. So it was on Netflix. I don't, I guess I didn't have anything better to do on October 17th. So uh, you, you okay? Hang on, let me go check my front door. I think it's Someone just buzzed me. B oh, B. okay. Did you get like a package? Amazon package. Eh. I guess they okay. rang the doorbell for me. Mm. That's what it was. An hour and 46 minutes.